Welcome everyone to the Kendall Report where I share my 40 years of experience to help you manage your portfolios and protect your wealth. Remember to subscribe, like, and share these videos. Before getting started tonight, I'm going to play a clip that I put together from Powell's statement that he put out yesterday after the release of the FOMC meeting. I want to give you my read on what he is really saying and what's going on here. So give me two minutes and change to watch this video. I'll come back then we'll go ahead and go through all of the details of things that are going to be happening both economically, earnings, and much more as I usually do every night. It's just a touch over two minutes. Along with the recent increases in economic activity have come new challenges. After declining gradually from a peak near the end of April, the number of COVID-19 cases has increased sharply in many parts of the country since mid-June. We have thus entered a new phase in containing the virus, which is essential to protect both our health and our economy. As we emphasized throughout the pandemic, the path forward for the economy is extraordinarily uncertain and will depend in large part on our success in keeping the virus in check. Indeed, we have seen some signs in recent weeks that the increase in virus cases and the renewed measures to control it are starting to weigh on economic activity. For example, some measures of consumer spending based on debit card and credit card use have moved down since late June. We are committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy in this challenging time. We've been purchasing sizable quantities of Treasury and agency mortgage-backed securities in order to support orderly conditions in the markets, which are vital to the flow of credit in the economy. We will continue to increase our holdings of Treasury and agency mortgage-backed securities, at least at the current pace. Many of our programs rely on emergency lending powers that require the support of the Treasury Department and are available only in very unusual circumstances, such as those we find ourselves in today. As I have emphasized before, these are lending powers, not spending powers. The Fed cannot grant money to particular beneficiaries. We can only create programs or facilities with broad-based eligibility to make loans to solvent entities with the expectation that the loans will be repaid. But even so, the current economic downturn is the most severe in our lifetimes. It will take a while to get back to the levels of economic activity and employment that prevailed at the beginning of the year and it will take continued support from both monetary and fiscal policy to achieve. Our dollar swap line has really uh, restored dollar funding markets around the world to fairly normal levels of activity. Uh, we're going to leave those in place uh, for the time being, and we'll leave them in place until we're confident that they're no longer needed. There's nothing that's going on in, in the market right now that raises any concerns. It's just we want them to be there as a backstop for markets. On the other hand, it's important that the facilities stay in place, and that's why we extended them yesterday. It's important that they still stay in place until we're, you know, very confident that, 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 that the turmoil from the pandemic and the economic fallout are behind us. There's several things going on with the Fed right now, which is becoming more and more obvious. And one side, he's telling you that everything's going to be okay, but then he says, we don't know what's actually going on, but we're just going to be there. And I don't think that's going to be good enough for some serious confidence. Now, the other thing I made clear is they're pumping lots of money, and they're going to continue to pump money into the economy and to fill these gaps. There were other clips I started to put in, but I didn't, that he talked about a lot of the things that I talked about on the live stream yesterday. There are millions of people dislocated in the economy, primarily at the lower end of the economy, that are not likely to get back to work anytime soon unless these industries start to come back and it's obvious that they're not going to. The other thing that I told you he was going to say was he was going to say, we have lending powers, not spending powers. He continues to posture around this because he doesn't want any moral hazard at all. On these lending powers, if the borrowers absolutely default Who's actually paying for that then? Where's that money coming from and where's the liability? He's acting as if there's no liability at all. We'll see how this all plays out in the end, but the uncertainty is truly there and we don't know what we're dealing with on this virus, but it appears to me he's hiding behind everything on this. One thing he made completely clear is that 
the Fed is going to continue on a lot of programs that they started in March. They have extended everything until the year end, and I'm willing to bet that they'll extend it beyond there. I don't think many of these programs are ever going to end. He also made it clear that the fiscal side of things is going to be very critical as well. The last point he made is that it's going to take a while. There's a lot of statements that he's making and words that he's using that are very vague, what I call fluff words. So there's not a lot of confidence that can be built. And I think once market participants start to look and think about what he said, there's going to be less confidence. The one thing we do need to be aware of is that the pumping will continue. As we start Thursday, we're going to have a lot going on as we've got the unemployment claims coming out. Chairman Powell may have revealed what the number is on these continuing claims. He mentioned that there are 14 million people still out of work. We'll have to see if that's where the number is. In the last report, we were closer to 17. If that number comes out, then he definitely had a slip of the tongue. And we know that that number is going to be better than expected. The other thing that will occur is there's plenty of earnings coming out before the opening, which is going to set the tone as well after we've seen these other numbers. But after the close, the big guys are coming out. we got the Apple, the Googles, the Amazons, you name it. They're all coming out after the close, setting up some sort of scenario for Friday. We'll have to see how that comes out tomorrow to figure that out. But the activity that we saw in the markets today, obviously we're quite strong, rebounding back above the 3245 level on the S&P. We also saw the leadership continue to happen as well. The Russell was up about 2.1, NASDAQ up 1.3. We're going to continue to see other markets outperform the NASDAQ on balance as we go forward. Virtually all these markets are going into a sideways range. I'll go through all the details here in a minute, including talking about the database and the rotation that's going on there. Let's go ahead and take a look at the charts and see what they're telling us for Thursday. As we begin tonight's review, the database had very little action. We, we saw 270 buy orders with about 192 sell orders. So it basically is churning up here. We remain at 85.44%. Now I think there may have been a misconception in last night's video that I did as I was discussing a collapse in the database, in the short-term database, or otherwise it going back to like 40% bullish. I was not discussing a collapse of the market. That was not what I was discussing. It was just the database starting to reset. On the downside, as I talked about, and I'll go through in detail in a minute, the ultimate downside in this market right now is around 3130. And I do believe based on my opening comments that there will be uncertainty flow into the markets over the next couple of days. I don't think Paul did that good of job setting a good positive tone for us to go forward. And with all of the news that we have coming out, everything from earnings Apple and Amazon and all the big guys and everything else we have coming. I believe we're going to continue to see this churn up here and see the markets move in this sideways range. And I do believe there will be some downside risk over the next several days. Don't be fooled by yesterday's strength. I'll go through those charts here in a minute. First chart we're going to look at here is the IJR, the small cap versus the NASDAQ, you'll see it continues to turn up. And I believe this is a major bottoming pattern that's happening on this spread chart. And we're going to see it move up substantially over the next couple months. And as I've said over and over for the last several days, is I do believe that it will be critical that the small caps, the mid caps, and even the S&P takes a lead over the NASDAQ to go forward. I believe the NASDAQ is way overdone. NASDAQ will be in a sideways range with a downward bias. The other markets will be sideways with a slightly upward bias. This configuration will take at least four to eight weeks or the next two months to unfold. So the rest of the summer is going to be this chop pattern. I just don't see the activity around the Fed and all the short covering that we saw yesterday being a significant event. Going to the cash market, we'll see that we did something else that happened yesterday as we were we closed above 
the market grid, we closed above the extreme on the market grid. And whenever that happens, we usually will see two to three days of downward action. It still appears that we will we'll move back down toward 3220, possibly going down to test 3200 on the S&P here. As we look at the market grid, you'll see that there's a couple key numbers and that cluster keeps showing up. It's showing up on the weekly charts. And I ran across something. I'll show you something in a minute. I'll bring up the secular or the monthly graph. Recognize something I thought was really interesting. I'll show you here in a second. R2 is 3273. R3 is, there it is again, 3281.94. There continues to be substantial overhead resistance in this market. The momentum is not responding at all. PPM1 remains at a plus 0.1, but is well below the value it needs to be to support the market. The 10 period moving average is at currently at 32.39. There is right now a 60% chance that this level will be penetrated and closed under, and that will set the tone for a move down toward the 21 and the 40 period moving averages around 3197 to 3155. The only thing that will negate this situation I'm talking about will be a close above 3280. If we get a close above 3280, all bets are off as far as the sideways pattern goes. We'll see a move towards the 3300. And I'll go through that level if it happens. The probabilities are fairly low at this time. Going to the monthly graph, what I want to show you here, which is really interesting, notice that R2 for the month of July is 3279.77. The high so far this month, 3279.99. R2 monthly was an exact hit. The one thing that continues to be strong, but the support levels are remain at well below the markets at 3048 on a secular level. There's no probabilities to take out that number. We have to go to the weekly grid as well as the weekly moving averages along with the dailies that I just discussed. So 3197, 3155 is going to be most likely a target. We'll see some downside as we go forward. Overnight right now, we are seeing some downward pressure on the NASDAQ. It's down about 48 handles on the futures overnight. Trading down to 10,624, it's actually the low of the session as I'm doing this. We're right at the opening of London. I'm getting this video done later tonight. S1 is 10,618, so we're trading at S1. Most likely what we're going to see is an R1 S2 session today. We're likely to move down towards 10,555. There could be a potential going down to S3 to STX. What's interesting in looking at the PPMs on a daily on the NASDAQ futures, we're seeing that PPM move back up to a positive level, just taking out the first derivative, but it doesn't appear to be material as PPM 2 and 3 are continuing to lose momentum, which tells us that the underlying trends are, are starting to fail on a short-term basis. On a weekly chart, we're actually seeing more dissipation of some of the upward momentum. It's still very strong, but the support levels are well below the market. 10,166 is the 10-week moving average. I don't see us getting down to that level until maybe next week. There's not going to be a lot of upside. As I mentioned in last night's video, the range is basically going to be 10,000 to 11,000. There's a possibility of moving below 10,000. 9950, 97, 93 will be a range that we want to watch. When this grid updates for the weekend, I think you'll see more, a little more downside on this market potential as we come into next week. The final market that we'll cover tonight is gold. In gold, just like in the equity indices, we're going to go into this sideways pattern. Momentum is peaked. I'm seeing analysts out there that normally don't say anything about gold all of a sudden jumping on the bandwagon. That can't be a good thing, but we will see a consolidation here. The market grid will set up the ranges that we're likely to see. Now, right now for 
Today, we're seeing 1923 on the downside. We're currently trading 68. There's S1 is 64, so we're trading at S1. We could see S, S2, S3 be 1950, 1936. R1, 1989. We've seen a high of 1987 tonight. So R1, S2 looks like the play right now. But this grid will be significant, so make sure you mark these numbers down out of this video. This will complete the broadcast tonight. Thank you for watching. We'll talk to you tomorrow night.